so today we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Professor uh, Dushan Lichina for a talk on uh, green buildings and indoor environmental quality. Uh, I don't need to introduce uh, Dushan extensively. Uh, Dushan is one of our main researchers here at the Smart Living Lab, a leading expert on indoor environmental quality, indoor air quality. Uh, most of you, uh, if not all of you know Dushan uh, very well. Uh, so we, we're not giving the formal introduction, but it's a, it's a great pleasure, Dushan, to have this general update uh, from your side on the future of green. And so without further ado, I hand the mic to you also. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the nice introduction. Thank you, uh, Laura, for making this event possible. And uh, also thank you everybody for joining and especially uh, to Sarah who joined from, uh, from abroad, I can see. I'll just uh, quickly share the screen and can I, Get a quick confirmation from you that uh, you can see the slide entirely. Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, as uh, uh, many of you uh, know, the, the research uh, and uh, research talk, uh, research focus of, of my lab, it's uh, primarily based on the air quality engineering. We study ventilation systems, air pollutant dynamics and exposure assessment. But today we're gonna talk about a broader topic, uh, a much broader topic, indoor environmental quality and also uh, green building certification schemes. Uh, as I believe this is a, a topic really uh, important to talk about. And also this uh, in a way broader topic might be of, uh, higher relevance to all of you who participate uh, today. So uh, we, we know that uh, from the very inception of the first green building certification uh, schemes, uh, they've been uh, having like a large influence on the construction industry globally. And uh, uh, today I'm gonna talk about, uh, first I'm gonna introduce uh, what the green buildings are and how they evolved over time. Uh, what is the current state of uh, knowledge with regards to occupant health and comfort? That's going to be sort of the key uh, focus of my, my talk today. And uh, also, um, I'm going to explore some challenges and opportunities at the same time that the uh, green building industry uh, has. So uh, I'll start by saying that uh, human health and experience, uh, you know, it has a very broad scope in the green building industry. And uh, I need to immediately you know, explain that, the, that I will focus on only foundational elements of indoor environmental quality, which means thermal comfort, lighting, indoor air quality, and acoustics. So of course, when we talk about human health and experience, and because it's such a broad scope, um, I'm not gonna be talking about necessarily social and economic well-being, uh, safety, security, accessibility, ergonomics, and so on, uh, even like uh, much of the policy development and economy. So I'll, I'll be mainly, uh, mainly focusing the talk on the key four factors of indoor environmental quality. Also, I will not be necessarily referring to indirect impacts that uh, um, environmental impact of green buildings have on humans through, through mitigation of climate change, but other I will rather be talking about direct impact that buildings have on people. And maybe one more remark before we start is uh, when I talk about green buildings, please do not mix term green buildings and green certified buildings. So they uh, green certified building that does not necessarily mean it's a green building. Another way around non certified building does not uh, mean that it's not a green building. So. Uh, just a small caveat in terms of the terminologies. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we will talk about historical evolution of priorities because in order to really understand the future, we need to also understand the past. Um, and because, uh, you know, from the very start, from the very inception of uh, green certification schemes, there have been two common goals. One is, uh, has been to uh, minimize the climate change by minimizing energy, material, water resources, site disturbance, waste generation. 
And the other sort of aspiration or objective has been to promote human comfort, health and well-being and generally occupant experiences. So um, these priorities uh, have been really drastically changing over time. And if we start from uh, uh, 1970s, uh, the green building, uh, like creating tools that did not exist at, a date, at that time, but they did emerge as a sort of reaction uh, uh, to implementation of various energy conservation uh, measures, uh, which followed the energy, the global energy uh, crisis is in 1970s. Uh, so because we so narrowly focused on just energetic performance of the building that also resulted in negative effect on people, appearance of the sick building syndrome symptoms and so on. Uh, so, and uh, this, as I said, led to appearance of the first so green building, uh, building rating tools, which comes from the UK, BREAM in uh, 1990s. And uh, these tools uh, emphasize, uh, uh, they, they emphasize the uh, various environmental health, uh, health threats. And uh, that included, you know, mitigation of some exposure to toxins, asbestos, radon, uh, tobacco smoke and these sort of like very basic levels which further kind of grew into more uh, reduction of exposures to to various uh, building materials of concern such as pvc and so on then in the uh, 2000s uh, uh, there was a shift in priorities because of the generally growing awareness about the uh, uh, climate change so the focus was primarily given to reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, back at this time, which is just two decades ago, uh, even sort of uh, uh, thinking or focusing on indoor, indoor environmental quality and human health was even perceived uh, selfish uh, back at that time. And then in the past uh, 10 years, uh, we have uh, a much stronger attention to human health in the context of uh, green buildings. Uh, and that focus has dramatically increased. Uh, and uh, even like the most recently uh, during the past year or two, uh, also the focus of green buildings have included much more uh, uh, sort of combating the, the pandemics. So uh, we can of course ask, what are the reasons for this shift? There are really many reasons we can, we can talk about it, uh, but uh, generally there was increased uh, awareness about the gaps between what we uh, what is the intent of the uh, design and the real outcomes but also development of the new technologies uh, increase uh, awareness about the the research that has been showing the positive impacts of uh, certain building practices on human health well-being productivity and so on so um probably the main reason for this uh, shift uh, of priorities towards uh, more inclusive like emphasize of human uh, uh, health in uh, green buildings comes from the increased awareness of the relationship between human cost and building cost within typical business operating costs so uh, this uh, uh, picture might be familiar to some of you but if we look at a typical uh, business operating cost we see that the energy cost is uh, actually minor compared to the human cost. It's just one versus 90%. So if we put a lot of effort to reduce the energy cost by, by let's say 10%, uh, that would result on the, in the overall money savings at about 0.1%, right? Because total energy cost is 1%. On the other hand, if we make the same 10% savings in the human dimension, in, in, in human cost, that would approximately translate into 9% savings um, in total cost. So small gains in uh, uh, staff health and well-being can deliver significant uh, financial savings. There is a huge discrepancy between uh, human and energy costs. So this has also been one of the reasons uh, of this uh, change of priorities. Okay, uh, here I also uh, summarize some powerful statistics, which is related to the impact of indoor environment on human health, well-being, absenteeism, cognitive performance. Uh, these are really powerful statistics. I'm not gonna read in details. Uh, some of us, of course, can question whether these old numbers are 
always true? Uh, probably not, but there is definitely a good science uh, uh, standing behind these, these numbers. And there is a science that support clear association between indoor environment and human outcomes. So the question that many of uh, building developers, facility managers, and various uh, building stakeholders, including us uh, researchers is, if we know all this, why don't we focus more on this 90%? Uh, I mean, uh, we of course need to think about uh, the energy because of the environmental impact, but uh, we also need to remind ourselves that buildings are not constructed to save the energy. Buildings are primarily constructed for humans, for us to thrive in the indoor environments. And uh, this has, uh, of course, more recently been like recognized in the uh, uh, green building industry worldwide. Uh, so the green certification uh, programs have increased their attention to indoor environmental quality. And uh, basically these uh, findings between the links between the indoor environment and human health and comfort have also sort of inspired the new generation of certification systems such as uh, uh, well or living building challenge and so other uh, so so many others like every year we have emergence of the of new certification programs and more and more of them uh, sort of give attention or stronger emphasis to human health and experience okay that's uh, about the background now let's uh, look into the existing uh, research evidence on the green certified versus conventional or non-certified um, buildings. This is, if we uh, say that this huge circle is the body of the, of the literature, we can see that a huge majority focuses on uh, energetic performance of green certified buildings compared to non-certified buildings. There is quite a number of papers uh, looking into that, uh, whereas uh, much uh, fewer studies have uh, uh, focused on the uh, general human dimension and uh, uh, basically a portion of that study focused on a, a human satisfaction um, through self-reported and subjective uh, means. When we talk about the physical uh, measurements of the indoor environmental quality through objective measurements with instruments, uh, there is a even smaller number of the studies, whereas a number of studies uh, that directly you know, compare health indicators between certified and non-certified buildings, it's barely existing in a way. So uh, what comes out from these uh, studies, which I'm not gonna of course, or score, of course describe one by one in detail, but overall I can just summarize for you that majority of the research shows that green buildings perform better compared to uh, non-certified buildings. Uh, and when I say green buildings, I should say really green certified buildings. Uh, and uh, however, this evidence is often uh, limited and inconsistent. And also we need much more evidence, especially for uh, uh, human health directly. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time uh, later on talking about this limited and inconsistent evidence uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, generally many research limitations that we apply in studying these phenomena. Uh, here is one representative example from Singapore, where uh, many green certified buildings, which are showed in uh, green bars here, uh, they were compared to non-certified buildings, but those non-certified buildings are compliant with the local codes, right? They're shown in blue bars here. So this graph shows a basic, basically distribution of satisfaction outcomes for uh, this green certified and non-green certified building. And these small dots in the kind of near the middle of these bar charts show the mean uh, values. So two things I would like to emphasize here. First is that green certified buildings, they perform uh, somewhat better compared to non-certified buildings. But at the same time, we can clearly see that uh, even if the green certified buildings perform a little bit better, they do not perform as expected. We can see that satisfaction levels are not reaching the end of this scale, as you can see, clearly satisfied. So, and we can in fact see that uh, satisfaction levels are barely satisfying for, for green buildings. 
So to summarize, this is just an example of one study there, many of them showing kind of similar results, including uh, some that we performed. Um, I can say that majority of data on indoor environmental quality and human outcomes are based on subjective assessment. That was the second circle, whereas the there is much less data on physical, uh, physical indoor environmental quality, absenteeism and health metrics. So majority of these studies say that uh, green buildings uh, uh, perform a little bit better, but not all. Sometimes, uh, uh, well, actually often this evidence is limited and inconsistent. And this makes it in a way uh, challenging to establish uh, really uh, direct relationship between green buildings and human outcomes. And this, in a way, brings us to the next part of the of this talk, which is research uh, challenges. So uh, this reason for inconsistent and limited uh, evidence that green buildings uh, cause improved satisfaction and comfort and health uh, comes from limitations primarily in research methods. Uh, if we look it into the existing literature, we can easily find that uh, there is a substantial variation in the methods which are used. And what uh, I could find from the literature, uh, one of the in inconsistencies between uh, post-occupancy research hypothesis and design intents. Uh, for example, if green certification system have credits to encourage access to, to daylight, uh, the typical metric used to quantify uh, is uh, this is a workplace illumination. And the goal is, of course, to reduce the energy for electric lighting. However, uh, the workplace Ill illumination does not necessarily well represent uh, perception of visual comfort, uh, circadian rhythm, human health, and so on. So there is this uh, sort of inconsistency. Then inconsistent and non-standardized occupant uh, surveys. Everybody comes up with their own survey, so it's really difficult to kind of systematically benchmark the performance of the two buildings if we don't use kind of the same uh, same types of the of the survey. So it's hard to, in a way, quantify benefits of green certified versus non green certified building if we don't use the same type of the questions, right? Then we have uh, what do we have? We have reliance on indirect and subjective uh, metrics. Uh, so we basically rely on metrics which are not necessarily fully representative of the metrics uh, on which the design of the certification scheme is based. Then we have a low control over confounding variables, for example, uh, socioeconomic, demographic or health uh, factors. And uh, if we do not adjust our data for these factors, it, uh, we, we might be uh, certainly introducing additional bias. Uh, which is the case in majority of the studies. Then we have constrained efforts to establish uh, rigorous peer or control groups for comparative study or objective matching between green certified and non green certified buildings. Uh, so for example, if we can uh, imagine a study, this is the one of the studies that, uh, that uh, Sarah uh, had. Uh, if we track uh, people or like occupants uh, transiting from one like non-certified into green certified building, if we do not establish a control group, uh, then it will be more difficult to establish this cause-effect relationship uh, and to isolate certain uh, variables of interest. And then also there is a limited consideration for sample size. If we have too small sample size, then we have weak statistic. If we have too high sample size, we might also have overinflated statistics. So these are all things uh, we definitely need to uh, think about. And then there is lack of reporting information specific to green rating system. It's really hard when you get access to the building to obtain all the information about certification schemes and so on. So it is then really hard to establish relationship between certain green building features and the actual outcomes that you, you measure. So this list is non-exhaustive. These are certain uh, limitations which I consider most important, but as a result of these constraints, uh, it is hard to compare the performance to benchmark performance and to draw more, uh, more general conclusions about uh, the actual impact of green certified buildings. 
another important issue is that green building industry is lacking a common and comprehensive framework for indoor environmental uh, quality design and operation. So in order to define uh, what really healthy building is, we need to understand indoor environmental quality and how do we measure it. So here on the left side of the slide, we see the summary of uh, indoor environmental quality requirements in uh, EN standard in seven big European projects in various relevant research articles and in 13 green building certification schemes, which are listed here. And uh, what do we see when we extract all their requirements that relate to indoor environmental quality, we see that there is a huge number of like we, we have approximately 100 indicators for indoor environmental quality. For indoor air quality, there is almost 40 alone, 40 indicators just to characterize indoor air quality. And they're massively different from one certification scheme or project to another. So uh, that means that uh, basically there is no systematic way to define what is the unified uh, indoor environmental quality framework. And uh, specifically related to indoor air quality and this slide that can equally apply to indoor environmental uh, quality. Uh, there is an important paper which was uh, published a few years ago, uh, and I'm just going to read this out loud because uh, I find this sentence very important. Uh, lack of indoor air quality metric or disagreement what should constitute indoor air quality metric is a significant barrier holding back innovation of indoor air quality conductive technologies emergence of undocumented methods of measurements of indoor air quality claiming their high efficiency and authenticity. Uh, this all resulting in undervaluing the importance of indoor air quality in different credit schemes and compliance metrics related to built environment. This sentence equally applies to indoor environmental quality in general. What is good news for us is that more recently we have uh, some new uh, research initiatives to determine a so-called overall indoor environmental quality rating uh, based on the quality of four individual components, as we can see here, indoor air quality, thermal comfort, acoustics, and illumination. So these existing studies adopt uh, indoor, air quality, indoor environmental quality as an index that has like linear relationship, that often has a linear relationship with the weighting coefficients that come with each of these. So, Typically, we calculate these indexes, I factors based on physical measurements of indoor environment, and these weighting coefficients can be produced based on uh, field surveys. Uh, we ask occupants directly, you know, how they rate uh, performance, uh, relative importance of these factors from zero to one. And uh, sorry about this <laughs> huge table, but uh, yeah, uh, the point of this table is really that uh, many researchers have studied the relative importance of these uh, four factors in order to produce some like unified indoor environmental quality index that can be used for benchmarking performance of the buildings. And we can see that really relative importance is really changing from study to study. People uh, see the impacts of different building types, environmental conditions, socioeconomic factors, all these can really uh, impact which matter uh, more. So what is certainly the case, all these researchers do clearly say that it is important for the, for the assessment of indoor environmental quality performance in green, green certified buildings, we need to combine both physical measurements and subjective uh, measurements of occupant experience. Okay, now let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, practical challenges. Uh, that green certified uh, buildings that the green certification schemes are facing in relation to air quality and health. So uh, first of all, there is a significant gap between relative emphasis, how much we energy put into energy related feature and how much we focus on occupant health. We can see relative emphasis here. Um, we can see that uh, human health, which is here in the red portion, is uh, relatively small compared to all these other environmental uh, features. 
specifically LEED, which is one of the leaders in the global green building certification industry. Now they focus with 20%, as you can see on this graph, it used to be 15. But what is maybe a little bit alarming is that uh, global, uh, ac across all the certification schemes, the good estimate is that uh, human health gets approximately 10% of the attention. So what does that mean? That uh, projects can very often achieve green certification without an emphasis or maybe with just a minimum emphasis on indoor environmental quality and the human health. So that's that. Uh, of course, why do we focus uh, so much on the energy and so much less on uh, human health? That's, uh, I think, an important question to explore. Potential causes uh, can be various. I have uh, drafted a few. One of them uh, is the widespread belief that greenhouse gas emission reduction and energy efficiency are the most important requirements uh, for building performance. This is a general belief, I would also say in, in Switzerland. Um, energy is easy to measure uh, and to quantify. You know, we simply talk about kilowatt hours per square meter. So it's a really, in a way, like low hanging fruit, easy to measure. Uh, how, however, it's much more abstract to talk about economic impact of human productivity and health. This is really harder to estimate. Then we also have misaligned incentives between uh, uh, building occupants, building owners, designers, and other stakeholders. This is a, a topic we can talk about a lot. Um, traditional belief that human health benefits are happening indirectly through reduction of greenhouse gas emissions which is in a way true, of course, uh, it, is, uh, it is important, but uh, uh, typically we neglect direct impacts that building, uh, buildings create on human health. And then there is a lack of education for HVAC design engineers who are pri primarily in charge for indoor environmental uh, quality design and operation. Uh, and they basically are taught very little about uh, broad influences that uh, uh, on, uh, of indoor environment on humans beyond the thermal effects. But this is also something I think we contribute to energy focus. And then uh, we also believe that indoor environment is associated with additional energy and investment cost, but uh, this is uh, uh, certainly not often not the case. There are many things we can do about that. Uh, I would also like to hear from you maybe after the end of presentation, what you think about this and if you have anything to add or subtract. Okay, uh, another important uh, uh, challenge for specifically international uh, green certification schemes is the lack of uh, what I called uh, lack of customization at the global scale. So basically international green, green rating system, they don't emphasize uh, specific regional or local cultural needs or climatic needs. Uh, and they don't use these uh, customized credit scores for indoor environmental uh, quality. So, and that can result in very inconsistent recognition of the two projects. And I want to just illustrate here, uh, Freiburg where the outdoor PM 2.5 is 10 micrograms per cubic meter and Delhi, which has much higher pollution levels. They can invest certain level of the efforts to reduce penetration of outdoor pollution to indoors, they might end up with the same outcome in a way, same PM 2.5 levels indoors, but the level of effort is huge. And these two projects will actually be equally awarded at the end. So we need to really work on the customization of the certification schemes. This is one example, I could give many others. Uh, but uh, we, we, we need to have a way, uh, fair and equal recognition for the level of the effort, not uh, just for the outcome. Then at the category design, uh, I didn't necessarily introduce what uh, system and category metric uh, means, but uh, if we look into specific uh, category of indoor environment, a majority of the rating systems basically push projects to uh, select one or a few indoor environmental quality practices. 
but uh, this is of course designed to provide you know flexibility so the project can choose whatever they want uh, from the indoor environment but it also creates certain situations where projects might not address uh, those key indoor environment elements which are which should be priority for that specific building or specific climate and also occasionally uh, it is possible to have a conflict between two or three indoor environmental quality strategies which is not really taken care of uh, within the certification schemes for example if we want to have individual control of thermal conditions in the space that might directly contradict with the let's say increase of the daylight penetration because you want to let's say lower down the shades so this is just one conflicting uh, kind of uh, situation then we also have inclusion of different iq metrics uh, uh, but that varies a lot from one scheme to another scheme if we take an example of uh, indoor air quality the most uh, frequently measured parameters are co2 and ventilation rate uh, or even just CO2, but majority of certification scheme do not necessarily include other important parameters. And as we speak, I, I, I believe that almost none of the certification sy uh, systems at, at the moment takes into account, let's say, uh, some biological pollutants, infectious disease transmission, circadian li uh, lighting, and all these kind of health relevant uh, parameters. And uh, last but not least, we have all probably heard of the practice of uh, so-called greenwashing through introduction of the new uh, building materials and products, which are not necessarily studied for uh, safety and the health. So the markets are currently flooded with so-called green products, uh, but uh, we really don't know much about their effects on health. Okay, then we talk about uh, uh, conventional standards and codes. Uh, it's first important to recognize that these large global international standards such as ISO, ASHRAE, uh, EN standards, they're basically generally reser reserved towards kind of new technologies, new solutions, forward thinking approaches and so on. They're typically standardized with uh, minimum acceptability requirements. They typically aim for 80% satisfaction and they also neglect individual preferences. Their objective is to minimize adverse health effects rather than to promote uh, positive effects on health. And they are, don't have objectives to promote uh, human health beyond the avoidance of the adverse health outcomes. Uh, if we look into the certain studies, it's interesting to see that really uh, almost all green certification programs worldwide, they rely on these conventional standards. Sometimes, optionally, these uh, certification schemes, they encourage kind of incremental improvements beyond these base standard requirements, 10, 20, 30%. Uh, and then for that, they could give additional credits. So basically a question we might want to ask, uh, are meeting standards and codes uh, sufficient or not? This is uh, one example of the study. Uh, that uh, was done in uh, 350 buildings. It's actually the biggest known uh, study on the human satisfaction within their environment. And this is an example just of the temperature. Uh, more than 50,000 people were asked how they feel about air temperature in a buildings that comply with all the standards and codes, just to make that clear. What do you think they, uh, they found? As you can see here that uh, uh, 40% of the occupants are dissatisfied with the air temperature, or on the other hand, 40% uh, are satisfied, uh, about 20% feel neutral. So really the takeaway point here is that we do use lots of energy and we still deliver quite poor indoor environmental quality performance when we focus on the standards, conventional standards. Well, the same thing can be uh, extrapolated to other parameters of indoor environment. This is the same study, but kind of, uh, I mean, what you can see here that the air temperature in fact is not rated as, as one of the major sources of complaints. There, uh, there are parameters that, which are even uh, more negatively uh, assessed. So I'm not gonna probably spend much time here, but uh, yeah, I mean, 
uh, it is quite clear that even this 80% acceptability target by the conventional standards in practice, it is not met. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about performance measurements from the practical point of view. This is really one of the key challenges in delivering this uh, targeted level of indoor environmental quality. And I would uh, specifically emphasize two challenges. Uh, first, the traditionally uh, green certification schemes have been uh, flexible. And uh, that uh, means that performance measurements for indoor environmental quality, it's uh, typically optional. If you want to measure it, that's good for you. You can get some extra credits, but it's not mandatory. It is not pre prerequisite. And the second is that uh, in those certification schemes that give option that you can measure performance of indoor environment, they basically use uh, very sporadic uh, performance measurement protocols. So I can give one of better examples, uh, which is available on the market. Uh, this is one of the most rigorous indoor environmental quality verification practices. And for example, uh, for a really huge building, uh, four and a half K uh, meter square, seven floors, what we need to measure according to uh, IQ verification practices just at three locations that we select. In such a huge building, we need to do measurements at three locations. Also, we need to do uh, one hour or one day for some parameters measurement, one hour or one day long measurement every three years. So we certainly do not capture in this way daily, weekly, seasonal anomalies. And also these uh, uh, type of verification practices are limited to episodic, resource intensive and expert uh, use only. There are, however, some experimentations with continuous sensing of indoor environment, which is great news. Um, however, it is still not uh, kind of typical practice so uh, projects can uh, run this uh, continuous sensing of indoor environment on a voluntary basis they might even get some extra credits for that but it's not mandatory we also have some kind of challenges there uh, because we need to take into account also economic consideration the cost of these efforts so again in well a continuous monitoring is done once every 10 minutes one sensor every 300 and something square meters and also there are some uh, even optional requirements for uh, monitoring outdoor and environment um, with a, in a certain proximity. So uh, there are many new players, as you can see some names here on the right-hand side, uh, Reset, uh, ARC, also uh, um, USGBC. They're, these new players, basically they try to work on uh, improvement of the these approaches for continuous measurements they will certainly also meet certain uh, scientific technological and legal uh, barriers uh, one example of technological and scientific limitations is the fact that low cost continuous sensors are unable to capture all the elements of interest for us and for human health and this especially comes uh, into play when we talk about indoor air quality. Certain air pollutants can still not be measured by uh, low cost continuous sensors. And in these cases, we need to still rely on coupling uh, low cost continuous practices with more kind of lab grade industry hygiene kind of practices. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, there are many other Practical challenges, I have just sort of emphasized those that I, that I uh, feel are the most important. Okay, uh, then let's take another five minutes to uh, speak about some recommendations for researchers. Uh, I will first uh, list what I consider the most important. Uh, and the next slide, actually, I'll, I'll also give some recommendations for green uh, rating system developers. But it's important to recognize that these two are really complementary. So one kind of informs the other. And uh, these recommendations for researchers are, in a way, recommendations uh, uh, that come directly from the challenges which I spoke about in the past uh, 15 minutes. 
So first thing first, we need to standardize research methods and use control groups, representative samples, and the same cohort of occupants, especially when we are comparing uh, directly performance of uh, uh, buildings from which, you know, uh, when where the occupants uh, transition from non-certified into green certified buildings. Then we need to develop and systematize metrics and tools to gather data that support benchmarking of IQ. This is what we spoke about. We need to obtain information about at the category metric and uh, credit levels from green, green certified scheme in order really to understand which green building practices have direct positive impact and which uh, not, and uh, where we should focus our attention. Then because we are often uh, focusing on the conventional standards and practices, and we are sort of over-regulating, we use a lot of prescriptive metrics, we should also consider shifting from this generic occupancy to a different approach that takes into account uh, differences between people and within a person itself. Um, then we need to improve understanding of the interactions between uh, IQ dimensions and give proper consideration of to metrics which uh, capture the effect of dynamic exposure indoors. We didn't speak about that much, but and then of course collaboration across disciplines is, is, is important. We tend to isolate uh, specific indoor environmental quality silos, but we need to really explore, explore not only links within them, but also interlinks with other health building and environmental social sciences. Okay, uh, how about the rating system developers? Um, we need to establish more evenly balanced goals for energy performance and indoor environmental quality. This is what I spoke about. And this really requires rebalancing priorities. Um, you know, we need to sort of reconsider what we prioritize in the certification schemes. Then we need to establish a minimum performance for each IQ category with the maintaining flexibility because without flexibility, uh, not many uh, projects would pursue a certification. And uh, we also need to adopt customized credit scores that award IQ uh, related action and address regional priorities. Uh, so, you know, here, for example, we can explore the utility of uh, different weighting coefficients uh, for the indoor environmental quality that we spoke about earlier. Then adopt full transparency to avoid uh, uh, greenwashing practices, more stringent requirements. Uh, we need to definitely transcend the demands of the conventional codes and standards as we could see how they perform in reality. So we really need to shift the attitude from nice to have uh, to must have. Establish frequent and robust performance testing and uh, enhance performance verification and response time through continuous monitoring. This is also what we just discussed. And adopt more flexibility. This, this really uh, comes into play, uh, especially in the recent uh, years. We have a global pandemic of coronavirus. We have outbreaks of forest fires and all these unexpected events. So we need to really focus more attention to resilience and uh, to really respond to these unpredictable events. I'm almost done, but uh, uh, in order to describe, uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning with the title, what is the envisioned future of green uh, certified buildings? I will use, uh, or I will borrow this uh, uh, Maslow uh, pyramid of needs, uh, it, which describes the uh, hierarchy of the human me uh, needs, and that can be effectively be translated uh, into spectrum of occupant experience that uh, buildings can exert on us. And as we can see at the very lowest level, uh, the goal here is simply to avoid the uh, environmental stress. Uh, and this is often sort of a basis for occupational uh, safety or guidelines for buildings just to be barely habitable, like nothing more. Then our buildings are generally designed for the second level, um, where the goal is simply to meet, uh, to have absence of complaints, let's say. So many of you are familiar with the thermal comfort standards, such as ASHRAE 55, 
that prescribes conditions in which 80% of, of, of the occupants will find the conditions acceptable. But we need to also think about if you're a manufacturer and if your goal is uh, to have not more than 20% of people uh, or customers, you know, complaining, then you would probably run out of business very quickly, you know. So the level above that, we need to aim, uh, of course, for the higher level for enhanced uh, comfort and sensory delight in which uh, individual needs and preferences and differences are considered. And what I put at the very top is uh, uh, an idea of well-being. Uh, as I said, the concept which is uh, gaining increased attention um, uh, within green building industry. So how we can, basically the focus is how we can create environments which support physical, emotional, social, mental, uh, health and also uh, cognitive function. So we can essentially see, uh, well, in this uh, final slide, we can use that spectrum of occupancy experience and translate it into this four tier building performance model um, where we have a progression from the bottom, which are the sick buildings to the very top, which is uh, what I see as the envisioned future of green. Uh, so as we can see the Envision future at the very top, it includes integration of the management of human aspects. So human aspects, I mean, subjective, objective, inter-environmental quality, health, human experience, and so on, plus integrated management of environmental performance, whatever that is, uh, energy, water, uh, use, circularity, and other aspects. So these two goals must be strictly interconnected because they, they are. So in these level four, tier four buildings, uh, they can be characterized by you know, different features. And I would actually like to also hear from you, how do you see this uh, 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 tier four level? Uh, characteristic which I see is a certainly shifting of the mindset from uh, you know, uh, avoiding poor performance to something, you know, provision of the uh, positives that support human experience and health. Also uh, more performance-based approaches rather than really pres prescriptive approaches, which we have in conventional standards. And maybe, you know, uh, why not? Uh, maybe we can also think about this future of green that support practices uh, that, uh, actually drive positive behavior of, of people. So uh, in a way, buildings that can even educate us and that behavior could be even uh, extended beyond the time we spend in buildings uh, you know, when we are not directly present. So I'll stop here. I'll just give a shout out to my collaborators, uh, which I spoke with on this topic many times. We also are, uh, finalizing the research paper on this, this topic uh, from research collaborators, uh, Sergi Altamonte and Pavel Vargotsky and the collaborators from practice, Chris Pike and Sima Bunger. So without them, uh, probably this uh, talk would not be uh, this informative as well. So thanks for the attention and uh, let's uh, discuss.